Section 2.3 Characterizations of Invertible Matrices We're going to start out looking at Theorem 8, which is the Invertible Matrix Theorem, and we're going to use this a lot as we begin to look and see if matrices are invertible. So for this, we're going to let A be a square n by n matrix, and then the following statements are equivalent, meaning for a given matrix A, they're either all true or they're all false. A, the matrix A is an invertible matrix. B, A is row equivalent to the identity sub n, since it's an n by n matrix. C, A has n pivot positions. So if it's an n by n matrix, meaning if it's a 3 by 3, then we have 3 pivot positions. D, the equation AX equals 0, which is the homogeneous equation, has only the trivial solution. E, the columns of A form a linearly independent set. F, the linear transformation from x to a times x is 1 to 1. And you should just know that that's true, but we're not going to look at being 1 to 1 or on to, which is what you'll see in part i as we get to it next. The equation ax equal b has at least one solution for each vector b in Rn space. H, the columns of our matrix A span Rn. I, and this is the one that again you'll know is true, but we won't be studying. The linear transformation from x to ax maps Rn onto Rn. J, there is an n by n matrix C such that when I multiply A on the left by C, I will get the identity. And K, there is an n by n matrix D, such that when I multiply A on the right by D, I'll get the identity. And then L, the transpose of A is an invertible matrix. So hopefully you noticed that we've looked at several of these in earlier sections and that many of them build on one another. So again, these statements are either all true or they're all false. Keeping that in mind, let's look at an example. We want to use the invertible matrix theorem to determine if this given matrix A is invertible. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to write down our matrix A, and now we want to row reduce it. And you'll notice that when we just simply row reduce it, and we don't necessarily get to the completely reduced echelon form, but just to the echelon form, that we can see in this matrix here that we have three pivot positions. So I have a pivot here, here and here. Since this was a 3 by 3 matrix to start with, then I've now shown that A has three pivot positions, which means that by our invertible matrix theorem, A is invertible. And remember that this was part C of our invertible matrix theorem. And a lot of times from now on, instead of actually writing out the words invertible matrix theorem, we'll just abbreviate it and say by the IMT. And we'll know what we're talking about then. So let's look at another example. Here we want to suppose a matrix H is a 5 by 5 matrix. And suppose there is a vector V in R5 space, which means there's five entries in our vector. And this vector V is not a linear combination of the columns of H. So now what can you say about the number of solutions to H times X equals 0, my homogeneous equation? 
So since v is a vector in R5 and it's not a linear combination of the columns of H, then we know that our columns do not span R5 because that's the definition of span. If they spanned R5, then it would be a linear combination of the columns. So then by the invertible matrix theorem, which this would be part H, that said the columns must span Rn. Since they don't, then we know that our homogeneous equation is going to have more than one solution or a non-trivial solution. So remember then that the invertible matrix theorem said if A is invertible, then our homogeneous equation has only the trivial solution. But since we've shown here that it's not invertible because the columns do not span R5 and they're not a linear combination, then we know that our homogeneous equation has more than just the trivial solution. So that means there's a non-trivial solution or just more than one. So we're kind of combining part H and part D of the invertible matrix theorem. Let's look at invertible linear transformations. For an invertible matrix A, we know that we can multiply our matrix A on the left by the inverse and basically get back to my vector x for all x in Rn. And similarly, we can multiply on the right by A inverse and get back to x for all x in Rn. So a linear transformation T mapping from Rn to Rn is said to be invertible if there exists a function S from Rn to Rn such that S of T of X, my vector X, is equal to the vector X for all X in Rn and T of S of my vector X is equal to my vector X for all X in Rn. So we call S in this case the inverse of T if those two properties hold and we can write it then as T to the negative one power. So that leads into theorem nine. If T from Rn to Rn is a linear transformation and we let A be the standard matrix for T, then our linear transformation T is invertible if and only if the matrix A is an invertible matrix. So in that case, the linear transformation S given by S of X equals A inverse times X is the unique function satisfying that S of T of X is equal to X and T of S of X is equal to X for all X in Rn. So keeping that in mind, let's now look at an example. We're given here a linear transformation T from R2 into R2 and we want to show that T is invertible and find a formula for T inverse. So you'll see we've written it horizontally, what we want to do is write T vertically. So here we've written it vertically and now I can see then that I can rewrite this matrix as my matrix negative 5, 9, 4, negative 7 multiplied by my vector X. So here what we've got then is my matrix A times the vector X. Now we want to show that T is invertible and if you remember from theorem 9 that we just looked at, we know that our transformation is invertible if and only if our matrix A is an invertible matrix. So what we want to do is we want to check to see if we have an invertible matrix A and thinking back on what we looked at in section 2.2, we can look at the determinant where we're going to cross multiply here. So we want to look at the determinant of A 
which is negative 5 times negative 7 minus 4 times 9. So we have 35 minus 36, which is negative 1. So we see then that the determinant is not 0. Since it's not 0, then I know that my matrix A is invertible. Since the matrix A is invertible, then T is invertible. So now to find a formula for the inverse of T, we're simply going to find the inverse of A. So remember that the inverse of A is going to be 1 over the determinant multiplied by this new matrix where I switch A and D and I make B and C negative. So when I multiply through by this negative 1, I will get that my inverse matrix now is 7, 9, 4, 5. And if I multiply that then by my vector x, then I see that I have now that t inverse of x is now going to be 7x1 plus 9x2 and then 4x1 plus 5x2. Now you try. This is the exact same example we just looked at, but I want you to try it with this new transformation T. I want you to first show that T is invertible and then find a formula for the inverse of T. So work on this and we'll talk about it in class.